Okay. Hi, my name is Rocky Yap. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist and hepatologist in the Chicago area. And I am honored that the American Liver Foundation asked me to speak on a disease I treat quite frequently in my practice, dealing with alcohol and liver disease. The American Liver Foundation is an outstanding organization. I'm proud to be associated with them. They help hundreds of thousands of patients and families not only treat and understand their liver disease, but many patients are cured thanks to the great work they're doing. So I've been asked to talk about this topic because of my experience and uh, passion about this. These are some of my conflicts and confession. They have no impact on my lecture today. So first of all, why is the liver so important? The liver is the largest solid organ in your body and it is one of the most complex physiological organs that we have. It literally performs billions of functions every minute to help support the essential functions of life. It processes food and nutrients, cholesterol. It makes poisons neutralized. It helps medicines become effective. Hormones and proteins and enzymes are constantly made by the liver. And everything you absorb through your GI tract is processed and filtered through your liver. And the liver is central to the metabolism of alcohol. Now, how does the body affect, how does alcohol affect the body? Now, from a modern standpoint, really, it's easy to understand alcohol has a very compelling property. It makes us feel good. In low doses, alcohol can actually help release serotonins and dopamines, endorphins in the brain, chem chemicals that make us feel happy and less anxious. It flows through the entire body, and alcohol, as opposed to some drugs, actually easily passes into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. Small amounts of alcohol have some beneficial effects, but drinking too much, as many of you know, can lessen your ability to think, decrease coordination, change your mood and behavior. And really, it also uh, has good, bad, and the ugly parts to uh, alcohol ingestion. So I like this, this next slide just because it just shows in general there are beneficial and harmful things to alcohol. Small amounts of alcohol are gonna have a positive effect on your on blood flow, on, on brain function, on cholesterol, on, on abilities to prevent diabetes, help prevent kidney stones and gallstones, a number of positive effects in small limited amounts. But large consumptions have a whole number of harmful effects as you see at the, the left hand of the slide. And so the good, as I mentioned before, there are several good things that alcohol increases insulin sensitivity and lowers your risk for the diabetes, again, in low or moderate consumption. It improves your cholesterol uh, profile, it can improve coronary blood flow and have all sorts of positive effects on the heart. In low doses, it can also, as I mentioned before, uh, minimize gallstones, kidney stones, decrease dementia, even improve your libido. And numerous studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol have some benefits. A, a classic study actually showed middle and elderly age adults can have beneficial effects on mortality when drinking small amounts. But the bad, and there is bad the, the, uh, that many of you are aware of as well. Now, first of all, what is moderate consumption? Now, that means one drink a day for women and two drinks a day for men. Now, no more than 14 a week for men, no more than seven a week for women. Beyond that, you start seeing many of the negative effects of alcohol. There are people who should never drink. Pregnant women should never drink any time during their pregnancy. People under the age of 21, we know from numerous studies that the developing brain, alcohol can have adverse uh, effects on it. People have certain medical conditions or taking certain me medications they should discuss with their physician, with people that should not drink alcohol at all. Obviously, recovering alcoholics should not drink. And anyone with a skilled job, like driving or flying, uh, brain surgery, or giving, even giving lectures with ALF, should not be using alcohol. Now, what is heavy use? Heavy use is 80 grams a day for men, 40 for women. You see on this little cartoon character, one drink is 12 ounces of beer, eight ounces of malt liquor, five ounces of wine, an ounce and a half of hard liquor. Those all equate to about 15 to 20 grams of alcohol in each of those drinks. Those are the, that's the guidelines you should use about what is moderate consumption. So then when you start looking at this, how does it affect the body? Again, as I mentioned before, it flows throughout the entire body. And drinking too much in the short term lessens your ability to think, decrease your coordination, can change your mood or behavior, make poor judgments. And really, as many of us know, it can cause actions and things that people regret 
sometimes for the rest of their lives. It also can cause anemia. Chronic use can cause brain damage, loss of muscle mass, pancreatitis, and even heart damage. Causes of liver disease, we'll talk about shortly, include fatty liver, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and alcoholic hepatitis. Now, this is uh, just recently came out from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, their position has recently changed. They think that alcohol actually is a, a carcinogen, especially the larger amounts you drink. Carcinogens including liver, colon cancer, esophageal cancer, oral and breast cancer, all those are affected by even small amounts of liver ingestion. And this is sort of their, their full statement that they just recently came out, out from. We'd like to pause and read all this if you can, but clearly the ASCO has concerns about alcohol, even small amounts as it being a carcinogen. Now, there's an ugly part, not only for the individual patients, but also for society as a whole. 18, over 18 million people meet the standard criteria for alcohol abuse and alcoholism. It's estimated that almost 90,000 people a year die from alcohol-related causes. That makes alcohol the third most preventable cause of death in the United States after tobacco and inactivity and poor diet. And we know that alcohol plays a role in many, many violent crimes. There'll be more than 16,000 people who die each year where alcohol is involved, it's estimated that alcohol costs at least a quarter of a billion dollars a year to our society. 75% of that is due to binge drinking. So how is alcohol metabolized? And this is sort of a, the, the nitty gritty of how alcohol actually causes damage. There are two important enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Alcohol, the chemical, the compound that actually makes us feel good, also called ethanol, is metabolized alcohol dehydrogenase by alcohol dehydrogenase to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is a chemical that has many harmful effects and what makes you feel bad after drinking too much. Acetaldehyde is then metabolized to acid, acid, acetic acid and then to CO2 in water. Now, um, there's a difference. Remember, this is very important to realize that there are differences between men and women, how they metabolize alcohol. Men have some alcohol dehydrogenase in their stomach, so they actually metabolize some of it before it even reaches the liver or the bloodstream. Women have very little alcohol dehydrogenase in their stomach. There are different ethnic groups that have metabolized alcohol and acid aldehyde in different ways. Slow, slow versus fast metabolizers of these two compounds are the reasons that some people never will be at risk of becoming alcoholic, and other people are at high risk for having alcoholism. Another reason that we sometimes see is a genetic factor for how, why people become alcoholic. And I love this uh, little uh, osmosis.org. If any of you have heard of this, it's actually many medical students use this and some residents. It's also good for the general lay public. I, I show this just that if you want to learn more of the, the details of how alcohol is metabolized and its damage it caused, this is a great site to go to. Again, it points to that genetics play important in how alcohol is metabolized with the different types of alcohol dehydrogenase, how fast it's metabolized or how slow it's metabolized, plays a big role in the genetics of how people are at risk of becoming alcoholics. So there are different types of liver diseases that are called alcohol. Alcohol liver, alcoholic liver disease, fatty liver, alcoholic hepatitis, and cirrhosis are the three most common. Now, fatty liver is a, a, a liver biopsy showing all these fat molecules that you can see. These are all fat droplets in the, out, in the liver that cause the liver not to function as well. And it's almost anyone who heavily drinks, even after one night, can develop some degree of fatty liver. It appears very similar to another condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, which is another discussion that the ALF has been sponsoring, but that's an important discussion. But it, it looks very similar. And remember, it is reversible. When you stop drinking, you stop seeing the fatty liver slowly goes away. Now, the next consequence of alcoholic ingestion is alcoholic hepatitis. We actually see, instead of not only just fat, we also start seeing damage or scar tissue, uh, things I call malory bodies, ballooning degeneration, inflammation, all these things you can see in the liver when patients continue to drink excessive amounts of alcohol. And you see here a picture of this, you can see this 
these large ballooning uh, liver cells surrounded by inflammatory cells that, and then these, these fat cells, and then there's these hyaline scar tissue that gunks up and causes the, the liver cell not to work. And this happens throughout the entire liver. So signs and symptoms of alcoholic hepatitis are to be relatively broad spectrum, they can be relatively mild, flu-like symptoms, but they can be life-threatening with jaundice, ascites, bleeding, changes in mental status, and even death. And one of the complications, you may recognize this, this and this picture are picture of ascites. This is one of the more serious complications of long-term alcohol abuse. And this is a sign that most physicians recognize the patient has severely advanced liver disease. This, this gentleman also has another complication, jaundice, where the body can't metabolize the blood <laughs> significant and concerning liver disease. So this leads to cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is really the most severe and most dangerous and complicated aspect of chronic alcohol abuse. This is where the liver becomes so scarred and so damaged by chronic alcohol use that the blood can't flow through it, it can't filter the, the nutrients you need, it can't take care of the medications you need, the poisons that can build up in the body can become toxic and extremely harmful to the patients when they develop this. And this cartoon figure, I sort of like this, it just shows as the liver becomes more damaged, more scarred, blood can't flow, flow through it, it finds other places to go. It, it, it uh, flows into the esophagus where you see varices and flow, uh, since it can't flow into the liver, ascites forms and fluid forms in the body. It can make the spleen enlarge. You can have all sorts of serious and life-threatening complications. And this is just a picture, you can just see this microscopically. All the scar tissue around a, a liver tissue that's trying to function with all these this scar tissue, the inflammation all around it. So the, now this is a, I love this picture because it just shows more graphically. This cartoon picture is sort of what a healthy liver looks like. And you see here, these severely damaged cirrhotic livers. So uh, cirrhosis is just a profoundly dangerous complication of alcoholic liver disease. Ascites, esophageal varices, and something called a panic encephalopathy where patients can't think clearly because of the lack of ability to to clear the body of, of toxins and poisons. Liver cancer, coma, and one of the most common, most feared complications of cirrhosis is death. Other complications include pancreatitis, heart disease, mental decline that can be reversible, but often is permanent, malnutrition, impotence, and the terrible loss of family and friends. It not just affects the individual patient, but the patient's family, the people that care about these people can often have their lives and their friendships and their family destroyed. So this is the simplest side I have in here, and it's also the most complicated to pursue. The treatment for alcoholic liver disease to abstain from alcohol. Again, simple, and most of you understand that, but can often be the most difficult thing to do. And so what we do what you do, if you're worried about your alcohol consumption, there's help. If you're worried about a loved one, there's help. And there are approaches that you can help someone who has alcoholic liver disease. Learn about alcohol abuse. Practice what you're going to say in a thoughtful, caring, lovable, but lo loving, but strong way. Pick the right time and place. Listen with honesty, compassion. Offer your support. And offering support is not enabling. It is offering your strength and support to help them recover from this disease. I also tell my, my patients, do not, do not drink around your friends and loved ones, even in social situations. This is, just shows it's common sense. If you have a loved one that has an alcohol problem, do not drink around them. Don't take, and don't take on the responsibilities. Help them, guide them, but do not take on the responsibilities. Don't provide financial support unless you know it's going to help them for treatment. And don't tell them what to do or what's best for them. I just listed these, and I'll do a little more of this later. These are just some of the organizations that are wonderful resources to help patients and families and loved ones in their, uh, their desire to help people uh, turn away from alcohol abuse. And I, I love these two statements about, um, about how you can help someone. Rather than saying that you're an alcoholic, you need to get help, you can tell them that you care about them, that they're important to you, 
and they're you're concerned about how much they drink and maybe harming your health. And I love uh, Robert Downing Jr.'s quote about this because he obviously had his own issues in this area. But ask, can you help someone get out of the woods? Yes, you can by not getting lost looking for them. So this is, uh, I just want to leave this up here just for a few minutes. Uh, these are the websites, the different organizations, Alcoholic Anonymous, Al-Anon, which is great for families, uh, DARE, which is uh, an outstanding organization to help teach young people to avoid drinking. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration is a great resource to find what treatment is for a whole number of substance abuse. The National Institutes of Health have a division, the National Institute of Alcohol, Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, also a great support. The American Liver Foundation also has much information uh, devoted to the treatment and care of patients with alcoholic liver disease. And family, and of course, family and friends are the most important. All these sources are, are places to go that an individual, a family member, member or loved ones, loved ones can help find a pathway out of this. So on behalf of the American Liver Foundation, I want to thank you again for taking your time to listen to me. I hope uh, this was informative for you and that you could work with the American Liver Foundation and contact them and support their goals in helping to end liver disease. Thank you very much.